Et pendant que nous nous mettons sur les la porte, nous avons un peu de vie de nous. Quel est le rapport qu'il y a cependant quand ces portes sont toujours fermées? As we take a flight from JFK in New York, Connecticut Post reporter Michael Mako and I soon see Haiti from above. We're treated to views of green hillsides, blue water coastline, and farming villages that dot the landscape. However, as we start to fly over Haiti's largest city of Port-au-Prince, the scene quickly changes as we start to glimpse shanty towns surrounding the city that are made up of nothing more than rusted tin shacks they are cobbled together with a maze of pathways that look no wider than a couple of feet apart. Soon after exiting the airport, we are quickly overwhelmed by eager taxi drivers and beggars descending upon us for a handout. Several even mounted our vehicle, doggedly pursuing us until our driver chased them away with a verbal lashing in Creole, the native language. Haiti is considered by many to be one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere. It is only mere hours away by plane from the United States, which is considered the richest country in the world. We spend a week in Cape Haitian, Haiti's second largest city. On a bridge crossing the Mapau River, women carry bundles and other items on their heads as the city's poorest slums come into view behind them. The vignettes of locals engaged in the daily grind of life unfold as we slowly make our way over pothole-strewn streets. Each block of the city reveals another overwhelming scene of masses of people trying to get by with whatever means available to them. Just before reaching the hotel, we see an armored personnel carrier with UN troops. We find out that they are a major presence in the city as well as the country to keep peace. The next day, we venture out from the oasis-like surroundings of our hotel and attempt to explore the dusty city. With some help from local resident Liam Peugeot, a Canadian we met at the hotel, The small streets teem with hundreds of people, all desperately trying to eke out a living by selling a few items right from their doorstep. On a daily basis, in one section of the city, hundreds of local people patiently sit inside the remains of a late 19th century factory building, with nothing more than a small spot staked out on the wood floor to sell any item imaginable. A path cuts through from one end to the other of the football field-sized factory. Like a vein that pulses blood, so do people who slowly stop and go as they try to cross over and through the packed indoor market. A common sight is meat, mostly chicken and goat, being prepared for sale. Flies swarm and buzz all over the meat, but Peugeot says the meat is fine for consumption after a quick wash. In contrast to the crowded marketplace and busy street corners, the controlled chaos in the street is equally amazing to behold. The city has no stop signs or traffic lights, but a properly functioning horn is mandatory. A cacophony of horns toot, beep, and screech throughout the day and night. Dozens of people make their way around town by way of local taxi called a tap-tap. These are usually converted pickup trucks with benches welded inside the bed with a larger than normal cap covering the back. They are usually brightly painted with all kinds of writing stenciled on the body to attract would-be customers. After a passenger is dropped off, a young worker who hangs off the back bumper will tap the hood of the cap a couple of times to let the driver know it's okay to leave. The plight of street children in Haiti 
is what causes many non-governmental organizations or NGOs to come to the country and try to help when the country's government is either unable or unwilling. One such group we see firsthand is Global Vision. Elaine St. Pierre, a Canadian missionary for the group, comes to Cape Haitian twice a year to personally deliver funds raised to sponsor many street children's education. The money goes towards books, uniforms, supplies, and other essential items that the child needs. The main reason for coming to the city is to investigate a similar organization, which was here to help street children as well. This time, instead of using a tap-tap to get around, we hire a driver to take us to the outskirts of the city to see Project Pierre Toussaint. First, we stop in the suburb of Bel Air to take a look at the former residence of Project Pierre Toussaint's executive director, Douglas Perlitz. The only evidence of Perlitz's stay was an old vehicle that was used to transport children to and from the school. An elderly caretaker was also at the home, taking care of the grounds. Next, we headed to the section of Cape Haitian called Blue Hills, the site where Project Pierre Toussaint is located. Even though it was only seven miles away, it took us nearly an hour to reach it. One of the reasons was because, even with the four-wheel drive vehicle, roads are barely passable as we are jostled in our seats and trudge along in some spots at only a couple of miles per hour. Another reason for the delay was that we took a few wrong turns, so we had to stop and ask directions a couple of times. As we try to find our way to the school, the sun slants farther and farther to the west with each passing minute. Yellow light bays the gray concrete homes which neatly line stone and dirt roads that cut straight through the pale brown fields. Twilight approaches by the time we reach the school, which is also known as the village. Project Pierre Toussaint was a fully functioning residential school in the suburbs of Cape Haitian. But in this school, more than two dozen boys have raised allegations of sexual abuse. Up to 200 children at a time lived in the fortress-like compound. The school now lies dormant, with security guards, the only residents at the school, roaming the grounds to keep would-be vandals at bay. The project's executive director, Douglas Perlitz, is now in jail awaiting trial for the allegations against him. It seems so wasteful in a country that needs so much to see a facility like this go unused. The nearby Catholic parish, which owns the property, as well as the home that Perlitz lived in, is awaiting official word about the project's fate. It will then decide how to best utilize the grounds. Thank you.